Welcome to St. John's United Church of Christ in Orangeburg, Pennsylvania. We're very glad to have you worshiping with us this week. I want to take a moment here at the beginning to let you know we will be receiving communion today here, Jamie and I here, and you can also receive communion at home. The elements have been blessed by Pastor Sean Van Dyke. So if you wish to receive communion, uh, please assemble a cracker or bread, um, and then something like wine, apple juice, water, so that you may share communion. And it would be good for you to pause this video right now and get yourself ready for that.
plug end of St. John's, uh, we have some good news to share with the uh, congregation this week and those of us who have visitors. Um, we had uh, Ruthie Gaston telling us that she had moved to a different room at the place where she's at, and she's extremely, she used the word, content. So she wanted us all to know that and to say she's going to be joining us once this uh, time of, of uh, sheltering is, is over. Wendy Wheeler sends uh, greetings to you all. She's down at Cape May Courthouse, actually, so I've been trying to get her to send us some pictures of the ocean. We may get them yet. Um, I found out from Jamie that UCC in Shenandoah, we have some uh, visitors from the UCC in Shenandoah Trinity, uh, Denise, Carol, Susie, and Cheryl. So thank you for joining us, and um, any of you, if you want to send us more good news, we'd love to have it. I would like to add something. When John and I walked around the um, path, the, around the elementary and middle school this week, we saw 11 ducklings with her mom waddling around. So spring has sprung and new life begins. Um, and I invite you again at home to use the royal welcome to, or if you're at home with a family group, I guess you can hug, to say and spread the peace of Christ among us. Let us pray. Ever-loving God, we rejoice in your presence in our lives. Let us see you in the beautiful blossoms of spring. Let us hear you in the sounds of the birds. Let us smell you in the clear morning air. Let us taste you in the taking of communion. Help us to be aware of your eternal presence that is with us always. Help us to know your goodness and steadfastness. Let us rejoice as your children today and all the days of our lives. Amen. I invite you now to join with me in a prayer of confession. Each of us believes that God already knows our sins and that he will forgive them if we come to him and confess them and repent. Let us now take some silent time to review our week, to see the things that we have done wrong and the things we didn't do when they were good that we could have done. And let us confess to the Lord silently. Friends in Christ, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is God's gift to the world and to us so that we may know abundant life. Our first reading this morning is the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Our Gospel reading is taken from the Gospel of Luke. Chapter 15, verses 1 through 7. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, 
does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. The word of the Lord. We have a special children's message for you this morning from one of our wonderful families. The Cookta family will be giving the message. Good morning, St. John family. We hope all of you are doing really well this morning. Today we wanted to talk to you about how Jesus never gives up on his sheep. Unfortunately, Kalmina couldn't be with us this morning, but Dimitri's here, and Kalmina's favorite things are here. I asked her if she could do me a favor and give me all of her, or let's say a few of her favorite things to share. Here we have her unicorn, right? Her unicorn? And her guitar, yeah. and her Minnie Mouse headphones, and her lambkin. Yeah. Her lambkin she needs all the time, but you see how small yeah. lambkin is? Yeah. Lambkin get lost really easy. And she gets very upset when lambkin gets lost. But mommy and daddy always help her find yeah. lambkin. And it made me think of a story that came from the Bible about Jesus. And how one time his followers kind of got a little bit upset with him because he was spending too much time with people that they thought were being kind of mean. So Jesus said to them, let me tell you something. Let's think. Let's pretend you have a hundred sheep. And one day you go and you see that there's only 99 sheep. And that one sheep decided to be bad and run away. If the 99 sheep that were there were safe and sound, would you go and look for the other sheep? Probably you would, right? So if you go and you look for that sheep and you found that sheep, wouldn't you be so excited that you found the sheep? And you'd be rejoicing and happy and run back to all your friends and say how excited you were to find the sheep. It's kind of the same thing, the way God is when he's in heaven and he's looking down and he gets so excited when somebody who was lost and maybe kind of forgot about God was found and realized that God was there and that God was always watching and that he was going to be okay. God gets so excited because he gets really sad when people get lost. He's always watching over us. He's so good at it that he even sent Jesus down here to help us and to look for people that are lost. We're very lucky to have God watching over us all the time. So in closing, before we, before we leave, maybe we could just say a little prayer and say thank you, God, so much for watching over us. And thank you for sending Jesus to help us save the lost ones. Okay. We hope that you have a great morning and a great Sunday. We miss you all and we can't wait to worship with you again. No. Bye. No. No. Thank you so much. And let me give a blessing to the children that are listening. Blessings to you this week. May you be well, may your family be well. And may you find and feel the grace of God this week. Amen. So, the Pharisees and scribes of Jesus' time expected a great religious teacher to speak in learned language and convoluted theology. But Jesus told stories that everyone could understand. The Pharisees and scribes taught that eating and meeting with sinners made a good man unclean and
and so they should be avoided. Jesus ate and met as many sinners and as, as often as he possibly could. He said he was sent to minister to the sinners, to save them, and he taught them in parables. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord. So Jesus told parables as a way to teach those who followed them, and to teach us today. They used simple stories that gave people heavenly truths. The parables were easily understood by the common people that followed Jesus. They could relate the stories to their everyday, every life experiences. The stories were very memorable. We have all learned many of the stories in the parables since we were pretty young and were taught to us in Bible school from the very beginning. And most of us, if I asked you this morning to tell me some parables, most of us could tell a wide variety of parables just from our own memories. Jesus was a really gifted teacher. This morning's gospel that Jamie read is one of the greatest parables. One of the beautiful stained glass windows in our sanctuary, which was chosen by the congregation that built this, this, this church, is a story of that parable. I've often looked at that window, um, and Jamie and I get to see the window every Sunday because we're up here doing the message, and you don't when you're here because your back is to it. But spend some time looking at that window because I used to think it was the window of the Good Shepherd, which it could be, but I'm now thinking it might be the window of the lost sheep. The shepherd is bringing the sheep back into the fold after he found it. So let's take some time this morning to reflect on what Jesus is telling us through this parable that he actually taught 2,000 years ago. Chapter 15 of Luke, which is where we find this parable, has been called the Gospel within the Gospels. William Barclay, who's a very famous uh, commentator on the uh, New Testament, says that it is, quote, the very distilled essence of the good news which Jesus came to tell. In chapter 15, we find three parables in a series right at the beginning of the chapter on loss and reunion. The parable of the lost sheep is the first of the three. And they're about the return always of something precious. So the first one is a shepherd and his sheep. The second one is the parable of a lost coin. And the third one is probably actually the best known of all parables, the parable of the prodigal son. Now all three of these tell of something lost and then a reuniting of some kind. Luke really wants us to understand this theme. He feels that it is really, really central to all of Jesus' teaching. It's an important aspect of God that Jesus wanted us to understand, and so he told a number of parables about it. Now, have you ever lost something of great value to you? Um, I did, and I will tell you about it. I remember um, one time, we were in a department store, John and I, with our three-year-old son, Evan, and we could not find him. He was suddenly gone. And the sense of panic that overtook me was unbelievable. Um, I couldn't speak. I just, I just wanted to find my child. I was terrified. Um, I couldn't breathe. I just, we, 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 we carefully retraced our steps. We were trying to get alert everybody that we could possibly alert that this child was missing. He was playing a game of hide and seek. So he had put himself into a clothing rack where no one could see him. And um, it took us a while to find it. Actually, it took about five minutes. I, it felt like an absolute eternity to me till we located him. He was laughing. He thought it was the funniest thing he ever did in his life. So some of your parents may have had similar experiences to this. But I was terrified. And when I saw him, that rush of relief and joy was unbelievable. Um, I was crying and crushing him and hugging him, feeling I was never going to let him go. 
So what if that is the way that God feels about each of us when we stray from the path and then we return? In the Jewish tradition Jesus came from, the path to God was righteousness. To be saved, you had to repent of your sins, but you also needed to carefully obey the complex Jewish law. And that is how you were accepted by God. God did not freely give love and grace. You had to earn it. But that love and grace of God is exactly what Jesus came to teach us. It comes to us when we turn back to God and repent. It did not have to be earned by following the complex set of rules to the letter. Jesus taught us that God loves the sinner, that God longs for the sinner to return to him. Jesus called himself the Good Shepherd that would seek the lost sheep and bring them back. He says in Luke uh, chapter 19, verse 10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. Our UCC statement of faith, which we're going to say in a few minutes, reminds us of that. Some of the lines from it are, God creates man in his own image and sets before him the ways of life and death. That God seeks in holy love to save all people from aimlessness and sin. God seeks to save each of us. God is at our side every moment of every day as we journey through this life. God gives us our freedom. But he seeks each of us with holy love. He seeks to save us from an aimless and sinful life. He does not give us our freedom and let us wander around and if we find our way back, that's good, and if not, oh well. God seeks us. He creates us to love us and for us to love him. Tell you a story about the power of God's love and grace to save a soul. It is the story of the hymn Amazing Grace, which we are going to hear before communion this morning. Amazing Grace is probably the best known Christian hymn, and it's estimated, I looked this up, it's estimated it is performed about 10 million times a year. It's actually a poem that was later put to music. It was written by a gentleman named John Newton. And uh, in 1772, it was put down. It's the story of Newton's personal experience of loving grace that God gave him and how it changed him completely. Newton was born in 1725 in a London suburb that was a thriving uh, seaport. He had a difficult childhood. His father was a sea captain, so he would be gone for three years at a time. His mother died of TB when he was six. He was raised as a Christian, but he had no real deep conviction in his religious beliefs and went on to live an extremely undisciplined life. After a long series of misadventures, which if you ever want to read something interesting, he got himself into amazing amounts of trouble. Um, he was so bad in the Royal Navy that they actually put him off the ship and gave him to a slaver ship. They just couldn't stand him on the ship. Um, but he was on a ship one time, and the ship had sailed into a violent storm and almost sank. And Newton was terrified, and he cried out loud to God to save him from the storm, and God did. And he counts that as the beginning of his real spiritual conversion. Now, he still had a lot more going on before he continued his, uh, his search for God. Um, after surviving the storm, he became the captain of a slave ship himself for a number of years. Um, but finally, he had a stroke, and he had to leave the sea trade. And this time, he really turned toward God. He wanted to be a minister, and he could see that in the many disasters many of himself caused in his life, he could see the hand of God. 
He could see God turning him always back to himself. So he became an Anglican priest in 1764 and ultimately became very active in the anti-slavery movement in England and was blessed to be able to see England pass an anti-slavery law before he died. So let's look at how the lyrics of the hymn Amazing Grace reflect this autobiography of Newton, as actually as well as many of us, that have been lost and found by the grace of God. The song goes, I was once lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. T'was grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. The grace of God's love is leading all of us home. This story of redemption is not unique. There are literally millions of stories like this. I have heard such stories from covered up alcoholics and people with addictions who have turned their lives over to a higher power as the beginning of their, their journey through um, Alcoholics Anonymous. And that journey brought them back to a life of purpose and peace. So this week, I'd like you to really think about the times in your own life when you were lost and were found. Of the grace that God has that has saved you from dangers, toils, and snares. Of the love of the Father that calls us home to him as he waits lovingly for us to return. The stories of each of our lives are filled with the love of God working in us and around us. God is calling you and I to be the people that he created us to be. His love and grace are truly amazing. And we each have our own story of amazing grace. Let us now join together in the UCC Statement of Faith. We believe in God, the Eternal Spirit, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and our Father, and to his deeds we testify. He calls the worlds into being, creates man in his own image, and sets before him the ways of life and death. He seeks in holy love to save all people from aimlessness and sin. He judges men and nations by his righteous will, declared through prophets and apostles. In Jesus Christ, the man of Nazareth, our crucified and risen Lord, he has come to us and shared our common lot, conquering sin and death and reconciling the world to himself. He bestows upon us his Holy Spirit, creating and renewing the Church of Jesus Christ, binding in covenant faithful people of all ages, tongues, and races. He calls us into his church to accept the cost and joy of discipleship, to be his servants in the service of others, to proclaim the gospel to all the world, to resist the powers of evil, to share in Christ's baptism and eat at his table, to join him in his passion and victory. He promises to all who trust him forgiveness of sins and fullness of grace, courage in the struggle for justice and peace, his presence in trial and rejoicing, and eternal life in his kingdom, which has no end. Blessing and honor, glory and power be unto him.
Christ was raised from dead, appeared to Mary Magdalene on the same day and sat at the table with two disciples and was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. Men and women, youth and children, come from the east and west, from the north and south, and gather about Christ's table. This table is for all Christians who wish to know the presence of Christ and share in the community of God's people. God be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to God. Let us give thanks to God most high. It is right to give God thanks and praise. <clears throat> Let us pray. We give you thanks, Holy One, Almighty and Eternal God, always and everywhere, through Jesus Christ. We bless you for your continual love and care for every creature. Above all, we give you thanks for the gift of Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. By his obedience to you, by his suffering, on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. He delivered us from the way of sin and death. We praise you that Jesus now reigns with you in glory and ever lives to pray for us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit leading us into truth, defending us in adversity and uniting us in one holy church. Therefore, with the entire company of saints in heaven and on earth, we worship and glorify you, God most holy. <clears throat> we remember that on the night of betrayal and desertion, and on the eve of death, Jesus gathered the disciples for the feast of Passover. Jesus took bread. And after giving thanks to you, broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, This is my body for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Eternal God, we unite this covenant of faith, recalling Christ's suffering and death and rejoicing in Christ's resurrection. And awaiting Christ's return in victory, we spread your table with these gifts of the earth and of our labor. We present to you our very lives committed to your service on behalf of all people. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit on this bread, this wine, on our gifts, and on all of us, strengthen your universal church that it may be the champion of peace and justice in the world. Restore the earth with your grace that it is able to make all things new. Heavenly Father, we, we pause now to remember how grateful we are all the blessings bestowed upon us. We thank you, Lord, for this wonderful community, for this Christian community of St. John's. And we ask you to look over all of us as we cannot be together right now. We ask you to be with our children. 
our loved ones, our friends and family, our co-workers, people that we can't be with right now and wish we could. We ask you, Lord, to watch over our first responders, our nurses, doctors, orderlies. Keep them in your sight, Lord, and be with them. We especially ask you, Lord, for a cure of this COVID-19, this coronavirus, and an end to this, so we may congregate again together as one church, as one congregation, and praise you. We ask these things in all things, Lord, in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Take and drink. Let us pray a prayer of thanksgiving. Bountiful God, we give you thanks that you have refreshed us at your table by granting us the presence of Christ. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and send us forth into the world in courage and peace, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may God bless you and keep you. May God make his face to shine upon you. May God raise his countenance upon you 